All right. Hello, everyone. We are back again. Thank you all for waiting. I know that we had a mix up on the timing. So you guys have been so patient. Again, in this chat, I will drop a link to a discount code for Mainnet 2021, where all of these guys, actually, maybe not Mahilo, um, will be at Mainnet 2021 um, speaking. And so the, the conversation about scaling will continue. This particular crowdcast um, is about scaling. It's about side chains and optimistic rollups and ZK rollups and all that good stuff. Um, so I will just go ahead and pass it over to Wilson to get started. Wilson, take it away. Awesome. Thank you, Bailey. Uh, yeah, for anyone that doesn't know me, uh, my name is Wilson. I'm a research analyst here at Masari. Spend most of my time covering infrastructure, layer ones, layer twos, interoperability, you name it on that front. Uh, but I'm particularly excited for this conversation today because it couldn't be a more relevant topic of what we're getting into. I uh, also had some exciting news today, so um, even, even more on topic, but uh, I'll just go around and uh, introduce everyone quickly. Uh, so we have Alex, uh, co-founder, CEO of Matter Labs, who are running ZK Sync and ZK Porter. Um, we have Steven, co-founder and CEO at Arbitrum, and uh, Mihailo, uh, co-founder over at, uh, at Polygon. Um, so I guess to kind of kick it off, I, I'd love to get a little bit of an overview. I, I think one of the nice things is we have like the full spectrum of what's going on in the layer two scaling space, almost, but, um, I, I kind of like to get a little bit of an overview of what each of your solutions are, why you kind of went in that direction and, and what is your approach for, uh, bringing users on and, and, and kind of why, yeah, really why'd you go in that direction? And, um, uh, Steven, I'll start with you because I know you've also had some uh, very fantastic news today. Yeah, thanks so much and really thanks for having us. Uh, very excited to be here. Uh, it's definitely an exciting day for us. So yeah, for those, uh, um, you can check out our Twitter and our Discord. We've announced uh, today that uh, we've announced a fundraise, but more importantly, uh, we've announced that we'll be launching, uh, opening up the users today and uh, just sort of, sort of kind of anticipated. We committed to August. so. Chuck's watch uh, has to be today. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's coming today. And uh, there'll be a really, really healthy um, number of apps on board. You can check it out at portal.arbitrum.one for the apps that will be coming on live today and over the next coming days and weeks. But I think, uh, uh, you know, we'll, we'll remove the whitelist and allow, uh, you know, users to interact immediately. And that will stay tuned for uh, some more details on that. So exciting uh, to be here. Yeah, and in, in terms of, uh, uh, your question of sort of why we went the way we did. And, uh, you know, our Arbitrum has been in development uh, for years and years. Uh, um, at this point, uh, the company turned three this week. Um, but we were at Princeton University uh, doing research before that. And actually, if you if you look on YouTube, you'll find a 2014 video or 2015, which predates Ethereum, the very early, the very first Arbitrum uh, public mention that I'm aware of. So uh, it's been a long time coming. And, you know, to us, it was more, it was basically about giving an experience that optimizes for uh, the best case uh, and, and gives users a, a, a user experience that's familiar and, and highly compatible with them. Um, and uh, sort of, you know, that's the design we came to over over time and years and years of iteration. And uh, like every every design, there are there are pros and cons. And I don't think anything's perfect, but I think you know we're very happy with where we are today, and we'll continue to to iterate on that and, and try to experience, you know, make sure that we deliver a great scaling solution today, literally today, and uh, for for your, for years to come. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, going around the screen, I'll go with Mihailo. Uh, can you give us an overview of Polygon and everything that it's trying to do? <laughs> uh, absolutely. First of all, a huge congrats, Stephen, on the on the raise, and uh, even huge, even more importantly, on the mainnet launch. Of course, like very, very exciting. Huge congrats. Uh, yeah, regarding Polygon, I'm Mihailo, one of the co-founders of Polygon. Polygon is a, we, we think of Polygon as a scaling platform, as a scaling ecosystem, if you will. So, so Polygon, I believe, is the um, only, to the best of my knowledge, at least the, the only prominent scaling project, if you will, that is not focused on specific architecture and specific uh, types of uh, specific type of solutions. So we at Polygon, we believe that we are, as 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 an industry, as an industry, we're still in a in a very early stage of experimentation and innovation when it comes to scaling Ethereum and when it comes to blockchain infrastructure in general. Uh, hence, why we believe that it's still probably too early to commit to any specific technology, any specific approach when it comes to, to, to scaling. So that's why we are 
focusing on on basically all major scaling approaches or, or architectures and we are trying to help to, to stay on the bleeding edge of the technologies of all these technologies to facilitate facilitate them to to part the adoption and uh, uh, development and innovation with all the resources that we have um, that being said currently we offer several uh, uh, products scaling focused products uh, one of them is our PS chain that is the, the most adopted and the most popular solution at the moment the other one is Polygon SDK that is basically a framework for building uh, what we believe are scaling solutions and uh, uh, standalone chains and side chains and uh, in the future layer two solutions. We have uh, the, the third product, product that we have is Polygon Avail, which is our decentralized permissionless data availability solution. And the fourth one that we recently announced is basically Polygon Hermes, which uh, happened through the acquisition of, of uh, one of the prominent scaling, uh, ZK-focused scaling projects called Hermes, and now it's Polygon Hermes and part of the Polygon family, basically. And just to, to uh, add to, to that, basically, for, for, for us at Polygon also, I guess we are different in a, in, in a sense that for us, scaling is a kind of a broader concept. For us, scaling Ethereum means uh, just spreading Ethereum technology, anything that... Uh, um, supports or improves the adoption of the Ethereum stack and uh, uh, um, the general scaling of the ecosystem uh, is definitely a scaling solution for us. So, for example, we have hundreds currently of EVM powered chains. Some of them are enterprise chains. Some of them are standalone chains. For us, all of these, these uh, implementations, all of these solutions are scaling Ethereum and scaling both the community and and the technology the the adoption of the technology so i guess these are two major things how we i guess differ probably from from other projects of course i'm not saying that this is the right approach or whatever it's just something it's just a vision that we kind of feel comfortable you know standing behind and following awesome yeah thanks yeah definitely a, a multifaceted approach for sure uh so yeah alex i'll turn it over to you uh What's going on over at uh, ZK Sync? And that uh, sure. So, but before that, uh, uh, I also want to congratulate Steven and our Bitrum team on on the race and launch. And this is very important. Uh, Thank you. Just like uh, Polygon is leading the way with adoption, uh, optimistic rollups are following with much stronger security properties. And this will take a lot of steam from the uh, current Ethereum ecosystem in in terms of gas consumption because the the mainnet costs are enormous and if you don't want to trust a, a side chain with your money, then like you, you currently don't have any options. And it's it's great that you you can do it. You can do everything now on Polygon. You will be able to do stuff today on on Arbitrum um, uh, with uh, with stronger security. Uh, but at zk Sync at, at Matter Labs, uh, we are thinking about the long term vision of Ethereum as a dominant world financial system where like as a fundament of the new uh network of value which is gonna consume like, we're gonna like uh, on on board everything from traditional finance from new things in finance from uh like you know like give rise to to the new class of sovereign individuals with people who control their uh assets completely and transact with everything on blockchain and for that we simply lack the technology today like if if we if we are thinking that bold, we understand that no no existing technology is capable of scaling Ethereum to millions and hundreds of millions of people or billions of people, uh, and this is what we're focusing on. Like what what's interesting for us is this long term goal, and currently zero knowledge proofs. Uh, it, it's it's obvious to me. It's it's been obvious to us since uh, two years that it's going to be the technology that will power. Uh, all the blockchains and all, all the world of finance because it's the only technology which breaks out of the scalability trilemma. At least in one aspect uh, of transaction validity, you can completely rely on, on Ethereum mainnet for all of your transactions to be valid. Uh, and uh, this is what we're building. So, and, and we, we also are very pragmatic. We understand that uh, uh, Ethereum and EVM specifically, the solidity, the, the current code bases have enormous network effects and people are not going to rewrite everything in new languages. Uh, so what we're doing is we're focused on building in uh, EVM compatible ZK rollup uh, with an extensible, uh, which has very interesting properties. Like it gives you 
kind of the best of all worlds, um, the high security, like in the L1 and lowest transaction costs as, as in side chains with uh, some extensions, if you're willing to take some small degrades in security, but everything will work in the same system and, and we'll be able to scale to like enormous degrees. And, uh, and it's also coming very soon. It's not going to be there in, in, in a year. So we're, we're launching our test net. We're going to open it to public in, in a few weeks from now. So we, we actually, this week, we compiled the Uniswap uh, on ZK Sync and fully run it. Uh, it's, it's successfully tested. So like we're, we, we had some delays compared to, to the original roadmap we had. We were going to launch this summer. It's taken a little longer. It's a research and development process. Just published a post about that. Uh, but we're making very, very smooth progress, uh, nonetheless, and we, we're about to open the test. That's incredibly exciting. Congrats on, on that's a, that's a huge milestone. So really looking forward to that. But uh, yeah, thanks for the overviews. And um, I think kind of going to the next question. Um, one one of the definitely like biggest conversations around scaling is kind of like the difference between optimistic rollups and zk rollups. Uh, of what's going on. I don't think there's anyone better to talk about the, the kind of differences between the two than this group here. Um, so uh, Alex, I'll actually kind of go back to you and kind of like to understand a little bit more uh, between the differences between these two solutions. And then I'll, I'll kick it over to Stephen for any rebuttal or if you, if you any thoughts on that. Sure, and if you allow, I will talk about the differences from the practical standpoint. So, like we 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 have a lot of talks about the differences in technology, which people can look up and uh, see how things are implemented differently. But I think it's more more interesting, like what it means in practice. Uh, so, I, I would say that there are three main uh, things. Uh, number one is uh, transaction cost, which is going to be different between the uh, uh, zk and optimistic rollups. Uh, probably by m maybe by an order of magnitude in some use cases, it's going to be use case specific, but it's going to be pretty significant just for zk rollups, uh, like j just like on on the rollup side. Uh, the second important and a tangible distinction is the usability of withdrawals. If you want to withdraw from an optimistic rollup, uh, the native withdrawal will take you one week. Uh, for fungible tokens, there might be ways. To shorten this period, if you're if you're willing to pay more uh, premium to, to liquidity providers, uh, but it might be also limited in the capital, so you probably cannot withdraw half of your protocol quickly, uh, and you cannot accelerate it for NFTs. The NFTs will will have to remain on on chain and like cannot be moved as as fast. Like e even even using bridges, like there is no way to accelerate that. Um, and uh, the final distinction is. Uh, well, there are there are differences in security as well, which is like it's uh, most people tend to ignore this. I think they are very significant. In in the long term, you want to rely on the technology which offers the highest degree of security. So, like in, there are tail risks of centralization with optimistic rollups, uh, which. But on the other hand, you have also some problems with zk rollups. You might argue that the proof generation might be more or less centralized. But this is very nuanced. I, I, I don't think we can, can say it black and white. Uh, but very important is um, that ZK rollups can be extended and they can have an option of accounts with very, very low transaction costs, which uh, I would be curious to, to hear Steven's take on, on uh, how he sees it and like how, uh, how he thinks it, it could be, be done in, in optimistic rollups. Uh, according to my understanding, it's, it cannot be done yet. Uh, and because it will turn it uh, into plasma and will will borrow all the plasma problems to optimistic rollups. So like something like ZK Porter cannot be built there. Uh, so these are distinctions with that I see. Steven, yeah, go ahead. Any, any thoughts? I think, I think you're on mute. Steven, you're muted. You're muted. There you go. Okay, sorry about that. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, we got you. Okay. Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, it's 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 a uh, it's it's a great um, it is a great question and a really a great debate. And I'll say, you know, personally, like um, obviously, I'm 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 very invested personally in Arbitrum now. If you look back at my history as a 
as a, as a researcher, um, you know, much of the work I did was in cryptography, uh, cryptographic protocols I designed are used by like top companies in the space, like Fireblocks, Binance, et cetera. And I've actually done some early work, uh, back in the day, um, uh, in, uh, ZK stuff as well. So I, I have familiarity with both. I didn't come in with a dog in the fight, you know, and, and ultimately I'll tell you the thing I've learned more than anything else as a researcher, uh, is, you know, if we look ahead five years from now, uh, everything today is going to look primitive. And that's just the nature of what te technology looks like. That's just what the nature of technology is. So I think the first thing I'll say, and I'm, I'm sure this is true of all of us is, uh, we're going to put out what we think is our best product today. And, uh, and, uh, we'll continue to you know, iterate over time. And I think that's the model of, of this space in general. If you think about, um, you know, Vitalik Buterin in, in, in 2014, you know, imagine Vitalik said, oh, I can't put out, uh, Ethereum. It's terrible. It doesn't scale. I'll wait eight years and we'll put out ETH2, right? So he, that wouldn't work. Uh, you, you know, so there's, there's, and there's a massive network effect there. And so we, we believe is, you know, we believe, um, what's I think, you know, clear, at least to us is that. Uh, in terms of uh, roll-up scaling space or, or roll-up or, or security solutions that derive their security in Ethereum, Arbitrum is the most advanced today, and we're going to put that out today and get relief to users. But that's that's a starting point, not the, not the end point. But uh, um, yeah, but it's a good, it's a it's a great philosophical debate, and just so just to um, uh, and it's a great you know it's a practical debate, uh, obviously very practical, and we're all building different things. But just to uh, uh, to talk about you know the specific points that Alex mentioned uh, on trans on transaction costs, you know I haven't seen. Uh, and I'm sure Alex has, but I haven't seen uh, anything public on what the actual transaction costs of a scalable, you know, EVM roll-up are. Uh, I have qu serious questions about the efficiency of the compiler back from my research days. I looked into, you know, ZK compilers early on. Um, actually, when I did, I, when I did my PhD uh, proposal in 2012, I wrote my NSF. I was, I was a, a, a National Science Foundation grant, and the NSF proposal I wrote was building a, a compiler for circuitry. So I've been thinking about this problem for a while, and I'm excited about the you know, tremendous progress that you know Alex and his team and Starkware have made. But I just, I, you know, I, I haven't actually seen the transaction cost in that, and I'm excited to see it uh, when they release. Uh, that, that's uh, first of all. So no comment on the transaction costs, but. You know, our cost is as lowest as any rollup that we've actually, uh, any general purpose rollup we've seen. Uh, and the usability of withdrawal points, uh, it, it's a great point. So um, I definitely um, optimistic rollups have a, a withdrawal window, a native withdrawal window of about seven days, whereas um, ZK rollups can do it significantly quicker, um, depending on the speed of which they uh, post proofs, which um, I know in current systems like Starkware might run another range of hours, but definitely, um, uh, quicker than than one week. Um, you know, the way I think about this is um, over time that as the as the as the network builds up, that becomes um, le less important for two reasons. First of all, you know, as as Alex alluded to, on the fungible asset side, you have uh, projects like Hop and Connects that are um, building fast villages. On the NFT side, I think Mihailo can probably tell you, at least from my experience, that. A lot of the NFT projects are really native. NFTs, you know, people aren't really bridging. You know, I don't think CryptoPunks are going to be bridged to any particular L2. I think that you'll find uh, native L uh, uh, because the way that they bridge, you have to bridge them one at a time. It just doesn't. It doesn't follow the same model. So uh, I know you, Polygon has uh, has an NFT bridge, and I love Mihaela to tell us about the usage. My understanding is uh, it's not the most used feature, but really NFT projects are are, are more native. But it, but it's a good point. Uh, absolutely, that's something that zk can do is bridge NFTs. But my thesis is that these things get less important over time. I think it, go back to ethereum as the example you know there, there's no there's no native bridge from ethereum to bitcoin but you don't need a native bridge because ethereum has a massive ecosystem it has on ramps and off ramps and as we you know arbitrum has a massive ecosystem as well we have direct on ramps from okx we have on ramps uh, we're coming we have on ramps from huobi announced i know um polygon similarly has has a, has a great lineup of, of direct on ramps so i think bridging uh Bridging is more important in the world where people are going back and forth all the time. I think it becomes less important where there's a, it's a healthy and thriving ecosystem where people don't just come in to transact. They actually park their money there and stay there. And to the extent that bridging is important, I think we're in a very multi-chain multi world where you're not bridging just between Ethereum and the L2. You're going between potentially many, many chains. So uh, that benefits me. Um, you know, I, I don't think it's, it's that important uh, over time, but definitely I'm, I'm not going to say uh, it doesn't exist. And uh, and the lastly, I think the point that Alex mentioned was the differences in security. Um, you know, I'm very, very comfortable. You know, as a cryptographer, I'm very, very comfortable with the with the security uh, guarantee of an optimistic rollup, which basically says if you uh, can't, if you believe that you can't transfer, tra um, sorry, you can't censor transactions on Ethereum for a week long time, um, this protocol is secure. 
And I understand that ZK rollups have, you know, don't rely on that assumption. So even if you could say, uh, um, censor transactions for a week, um, you would be, uh, you'd still be secure and the money funds, there's no way to steal. If you could, a censorship attack and ZK rollups, uh, does not lead to stealing. That's true. That being said, um, you know, DeFi itself is so broken. If you could censor a transaction on Ethereum, for, imagine censoring Oracle updates and just uh, so like DeFi. So the, the analogy I like to give here is uh, it's like putting like a high security lock on a bathroom door. Um, you know, the, 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 the thing we're trying to secure is fundamentally broken if this property is, is broken. So we're very, very comfortable with the, and fundamentally, I, I don't, I don't think you can censor Ethereum for a week. So that's just a rebuttal to those points, but the, the benefits of optimistic rollups is a, um, you know, they're ready today, um, more or less, um, you know, towards a decentralized launch, you know, they work quite well. We're providing the relief when we need it today. And I have no, I, I will be the first one to tell you that Arbitrum today, when I look back at our academic paper in 2018, it looks primitive. And I'm sure when I look back in three years at every one of our projects, that will be the same. Uh, but we're trying to provide relief today. And we're going to, you know, we're, we raised $120 million today, not because we're stopping here, but because we're continuing and building our teams. How do we get better? How do we improve? And, you know, for the reasons I mentioned, I don't necessarily think that ZK is the, is the way, uh, is, will be the winning technology in three, four years. But I can tell you whatever uh, it will be, and I'm sure it will be something that, that's, that doesn't exist today, uh, you know, will we'll be there. So, so what about ZK Porter? This is, this is the, the most important distinction. Yeah, great. Oh, that's a great, great point. Uh, I don't, so if you actually look back at the initial Arbitrum paper, uh, it's a bit of a technical nuance conversation that that's in a, in a very similar model. Uh, we called it, uh, it's, it's not in the rollup model. It's in the any trust model. Uh, it's actually in a, in a, in a, I think a stronger model because ZK Porter, if I understand correctly, has some sort of, um, consensus level assumption on the data availability where this was uh, an any trust assumption. So a one out of N assumption. So, um, uh, I do think that there are some benefits on the ZK side of the uh, compatibility between these two, that that's something which I, I would definitely agree with. But I think, um, you know, my vision of the space is, um, you know, <laughs> the demand is going so high that um, we're going to have to almost self shard into, I think, scap and vertical. So um, I think we'll see the multi-chain roll up world. Like we're seeing with Reddit and Arbitrum, Reddit launched an Arbitrum chain, and I'm happy that it's not an Arbitrum one because they don't need composability with Arbitrum one. So this to me is, is very important because the thing that none of our solutions solve is, is a state growth problem, right? Even if we could do a hundred thousand transactions per second, God, let's not do that in one chain. Like there's that, that's bad. And maybe, and that's another place which I'm hoping there'll be some fundamental uh, advances in research, but uh, yeah. So I'm not, I'm not, you know, uh, as an academic, I, I agree with, you know, the points. I think that, that there definitely are some, some benefits. I know the other one you like to talk about, which is definitely true is um, compressing over time, but I think there are also drawbacks there in compressing like Oracle updates, but that also requires you not to post on chain, on chain that frequently. So I think everything has drawbacks. Uh, you know, I think, you know, we make a set of trade-offs, which we're comfortable with, but uh, I think that you definitely have a different set of trade-offs, which I, I respect and, and understand um, why some users might, you know, might prefer some of those. Awesome. I, yeah, great back and forth, not, and, and Alex, I'll let, you, I'll let any rebuttals come in at the end, but I definitely want to jump over to uh, Mihalo and kind of give an overview of uh, uh, Polygon's commit chain, the way it is right now, and then how it's other uh, ideas, what like with Hermes and like any, any other solutions, how that would fit into the overall structure of what they're trying to do. Sure, sure. First of all, this was, of course, a great, great discussion. I mean, great, great uh, points made by both Alex and, and Steven. And uh, yeah, on, on our side, we, decided like i i have personally been involved with uh, ethereum scaling uh, research since 2017 i guess since plasma became a, a topic and i was deeply involved with plasma research back in the days and then since then i i, I tried to follow the the the, um, the, uh, the latest uh, all the latest basically uh, and popular approaches and at some point it just became somewhat obvious to me that we definitely need something today so we cannot wait for six or eight months or 10 months. And these, uh, um, these, these things are in scaling Ethereum uh, uh, while keeping, while preserving decentralization, high security guarantees, and, and actually achieving high throughput. It's like really, really challenging uh, set of constraints and really, really challenging uh, uh, undertaking, basically. So, so we understood that we need solutions today, and hence why we... Uh, uh, went forward with with the commit chain. Commit chain is um, a scaling solution that is that depends 
uh, mainly on its own set of validators. So it's proof of stake secured validator set that today has more than $2 billion under stake. So it's a pretty significant, I would say, economic security uh, that, uh, that the chain offers. And uh, it defers to, to a regular side chain, if you will, uh, uh, in several aspects. But I guess the, the major aspect is that the whole validator set is fully dependent, fully de implemented on Ethereum itself, on layer one. So that differs, that's how it differs mainly from, from regular, regular uh, side chains. And that, uh, that significantly improves the security of the system, uh, especially when it comes to bridging assets. So when you want to go back, for example, from our POS chain back to, to the Ethereum mainnet, you have the security, the whole validator set is implemented on Ethereum. So we can verify. Uh, uh, yeah, and another thing that I want to say, the uh, uh, important component of our POS chain is the bridge itself. And the bridge itself is, to, to the best of my knowledge, uh, someone please correct me if maybe you have some other information, is the only uh, um, bridge operated by the whole validator set. So normally bridges are operated by a small set of usually proof authority signers, maybe four or five signers that are actually uh, uh, controlling the bridge effectively. With POS chain, the bridge is controlled by the whole validator set. So the, the, the bridge guarantees are the same as the, the proof of stake guarantees of the whole chain. So that's something that I think very, I, I figure that very few people actually know that. And that's very important in terms of security. And uh, again, as I said, that whole validator set, their signatures get verified on Ethereum with every checkpoint. And when the assets are being transferred back to the mainnet, so you actually, the mainnet validators, the mainnet uh, um, miners actually validate that two thirds of these $2 billion have actually signed and committed, yes, this, these exits and these transactions are valid. So that's something that uh, uh, significantly adds to the security of the, the implementation overall, at least in my opinion. Um, moving forward to, to future solutions, as I said, we, we definitely needed something that is scalable, that is EVM compatible, and that has decent security. And we needed that today because the pressure on the Ethereum mainnet became extremely huge. Uh, uh, and that's why actually we saw this huge level of adoption at Polygon. We are incredibly happy to see that, of course. And now we're seeing that we're seeing that long tail of users that were priced out of layer one, basically now appearing on, on Polygon. So you have this blue chip, blue chip apps like Aave and Curve and uh, Sushi, and they have actually twice as many users on Polygon compared to layer one. And they're on Polygon for like one or two months. So you have all these users that were unable basically to use Ethereum and to participate in Web3 in general. Uh, uh, now showing up there. But yeah, sorry for derailing the, the, the conversation a little bit. Uh, my point was, this was something that we had to offer as, as an immediate relief for the pressing scaling uh, uh, challenges. Moving forward, we really want to, as I said, support. We are actively exploring all the, the scaling approaches and architectures. We are, at least at this point, probably a little bit biased towards ZK-based uh, solutions. And hence why we recently uh, announced this uh, acquisition of Hermes. And alongside we did this uh, big 1 billion commitment from our treasury to, to actually continue working on, on ZK-based solutions. But we see definitely merits, very, uh, merits of both approaches, both optimistic and, and ZK-based solutions are very clear. We are very excited about both. We will continue actively to explore both and work on uh, implementations whenever possible. And yeah, I, I hope that answers the question. Uh, that no, it, it definitely did. I, I, I have a couple of uh, quick follow-ups. Is uh, I actually didn't know that about the bridge. I, I thought it was a, a, a much smaller thing. That uh, I thought it was like a five of eight multi-sig. Is that is that incorrect, or do you like shuffle? No, that's absolutely incorrect. There's a lot of how can I say? I, I don't want to say fun. People are of course expressing their concerns online and Twitter and elsewhere. Uh, it is uh, when when multi-sig is mentioned. We are talking about upgradable contracts, basically. So 
pretty much to the best of my knowledge, please anyone correct me if I'm uh, wrong, I, I'm only, I think only a scaling solution named Fuel doesn't really have upgradable contracts, to the best of my knowledge. I think Arbitrum, Matter Labs, and all other scaling projects have upgradable contracts. The multi sigs can differ in number of participants, whether they are time locks and whatnot, some, some nuances, but uh, upgradable contracts are very important for several uh, uh, reasons, but we kind of all use them. And that's a completely separate topic mm -hmm. from from the actual security and actual signers of the bridge. So I, I, uh, that's an excellent point that you're making. So many people are unaware of, of that fact that you actually, the bridge is actually controlled by two thirds of a, of a stake and stake is more than $2 billion. So it's a huge economic security that you have. Uh, but again, mm -hmm. we are, again, as Steven said, like in, in one year, two years, three years, these solutions will this solution that you're using today that we're working on today will look uh, i don't want to say ridiculous but we uh, we're marching constantly towards some better solutions stronger security guarantees deriving security from the ethereum mainnet etc but yeah i guess we just have to go one step at a time so i i would like to add something i think this is a very interesting topic of security in general and uh we are uh, uh, in a in a space where, like, I would not feel very comfortable putting a lot, like, large fraction of my personal wealth on any of the L2 solutions which currently exist, including zk -Sync. So we're 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 not there yet in terms of absolute security, and I, like, it, it's really important for people to understand that, like, uh, you are dealing with risks. There are thicker risks. There are like longer tail risks, but the risks are there. And you, you have like, they, they are stemming from both the inherent, inherent properties of the protocol and from the uh, potential bugs in the implementation. And uh, upgradability is, is, a, um, is like one thing which makes our lives as developers very easy because we don't have to convince users to jump on the new version. We can just introduce a new uh, upgrade and, and just like everyone automatically moves in. Uh, but you have to understand that every upgrade is essentially deployment of an entirely new system without prehistory. You know, you, you don't deploy some, like with, when you deploy Uniswap version three or version four, uh, you can bootstrap it with little liquidity in the beginning. And if there are any, uh, any potential exploits, they will be found very quickly and it will be hacked. And, and then like, it will be drained before a lot of people move funds there. But if you do an upgrade and you just like moved over several billions of dollars on a new version and you forgot something very small it can be hacked and everybody can be wrecked and we can have another mount gox event and and like th this this actually happened multiple times in the past and this will likely happen in the future so you want to be very conservative and specifically on on the topic of upgrades this is why in zk sync we are very strict about introducing time uh delays so like we cannot upgrade at any time because this would mean that the security of ZK rollups, or in case of Polygon, the security of the uh, proof of stake chain is overridden by the security of the, uh, the multi-sig. So if you don't have any time lock, then doesn't matter how many, how many billions you have at stake. Like if those five people or three people or two people who are, like, are compromised and they are an easy target, and we're talking about billions of dollars. Have you guys read about Stuxnet? To what length can people go to implement a hack and like bring it over air gap systems to some like highly secured military nuclear facility, like using a number of uh, zero day vulnerabilities and some social engineering and some very complicated intelligence actions. And if you have billions of dollars at stake, this can happen. Like if you just need to hack uh, hardware keys or like uh, computers of three people, this will happen, right? So like you, you want to prevent that situation. And this is why like every upgrade we do must be introduced it's visible on chain. Everyone, like our team, will see it. Everyone else will see it, and people can react and can they they can withdraw the funds if, if necessary, right? So this is one way to prevent it. But uh, I, I'm still not comfortable completely with this approach. We're going to announce something something more uh, uh, more powerful for zk Sync version two uh, with with the even more sophisticated upgrade mechanism. Uh, but generally, risks are there, uh, even if you rely on proof of stake. Like if you have $2 billion stake on Polygon, but you have 10 billion uh, total value locked, it means that you have a difference of $8 billion 
like crying to be to be hot you know like he, 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 like if if someone had two billions uh eagerly available or like they could borrow it through some you know like not flash loans because you need the flash loans only work one transaction but like if you could borrow it for some longer period of time and then return you could easily uh put it on the on on stake take all the money from the pos chain bring it over to ethereum irreversibly and then pay back your your loan right so like this can happen In, or, or what what's what's even more realistic uh is that like if you have uh a lot like a few nodes a few servers will have the keys that control over the quorum of the stake necessary to conduct a transaction if those servers are hacked and it's really hard to protect the the server's keys then the all of the funds can be stolen and this is a much easier operation so things like this must be taken into account and like there are big risks just just, just want to say it out loud yeah excellent excellent points but if if i can add or sorry steven did you want to maybe jump in? No, no by all means please yeah okay yes yeah, so, so alex made a few great points great points regarding the the amount of uh, money that is in general an ecosystem the amount of money and figures that are flying around are are huge basically and sometimes even of course uh, you can't feel as a founder of a scaling project you can't really feel comfortable uh, um, seeing all that money because uh, uh, these technologies are still new of course we're doing our best we are we have i don't even know how many audits of of our tech we are engaging i i can't even talk about all our security practices of course and all that but we're really doing our best we're engaged with white hack, hacker groups and whatnot we are really doing our best but again, as Alex said, sometimes I even think when I see that some elements of the front end of interfaces or UX that can be improved, that should be improved, I even think maybe it's good that interfaces are not that great because then even more money from even uh, uh, not that ed educated users will, will flow into the system. Yeah. But the, the second point um, Alex made uh, um, regarding uh, upgradable uh contracts and multi-sigs uh, um there are always trade-offs like uh, for example I, with polygon we don't use the, let, just to be clear for us it as founders it will be the easiest if there is no multi-sig multi-sig is exposing certain people to certain risks like that's something that would be absolutely the easiest thing for us we can just kill it now in two minutes and you know, we as co-founders who sleep peacefully, but if something happens, if some problem happens, a bug or something that has to be mitigated, uh, what are we going to do then? And it's not that Alex, Alex, as Alex said, um, upgradable contracts are good and make developers' life easier for uh, uh, when new versions are being introduced. But for me, they're even more important that in case of, I don't know, some catastrophic bugs or something that can always be discovered. And in, in that situation, if you have time locks, let's say you have time lock of two weeks and a bug, critical bug is exposed, what are you going to do then? You're exposed for two weeks. So, so there are always trade-offs. And uh, regarding the, the, the last point that Alex made regarding the economic security of the, of the, the PS chain and, and, and the bridge, it's definitely, I would say, not that straightforward. And, uh, if we're discussing like once you go to these huge figures once once you have two billion it's not like you simply do the quick math it's like 10 billion minus two equals eight so i can i, I can extract eight billion in value it doesn't really work like that for for mul multiple reasons but i guess it's something that might take a little bit of time if you want to discuss we can discuss that if 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 we want of course but it just would take a little bit of time to to going to uh, i just 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 want to answer the question like what we will will we do if there is a bug and it must be fixed faster than two weeks uh we have a mechanism to accelerate the upgrades through uh what we call a easy kissing security council which consists of a lot of members uh, uh of ethereum community who are highly prominent and like all of them have to sign or like most of them have to sign a uh, transaction multi-sig in order to accelerate the upgrade and like they will only sign if there is really an emergency and they will see the code they will see the motivation for that but but then that uh, effectively kind of overrides the the whole time lock so you're no it, it can only shorten it it can never shorten it to zero 
you you, you always have like minimum uh, uh, threshold of three days. Uh, okay, so in that case, you would be exposed for three days instead. Uh, of yeah. Yes, and we, we can, like, it's also nuanced. In, in some cases, you really want to be locked on time. Like, it, it, it's it's counterintuitive, but we, we're going to write about it in, in a separate post. It's it's interesting. Like, sometimes you don't want to be able to immediately fix the problem. Yeah. But there's yeah, trade-offs. Yeah. Trade there are trade-offs, trade-offs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think everything that every choice, every design choice is a trade-off. And I, I think what you're saying is making a lot of sense. I mean, when it comes down to it, First principles. We're trying to make it so we want we want to scale the scale. We want to theorem to scale, but we want it to scale safely. Ultimately, you want to keep users' fun safe. You want to make the experience like that. That's what can really you uh, ruin a user's experience. Um, and so I think having that being having a conservative approach is definitely the the right way to think about it from from a per first principle standpoint. Um, I definitely give Stephen if you want to chime in on this as well. And then there are a couple of topics I want to get to before we answer some of the audience questions. Yeah, no, I think the, um, am I muted? Cool, I'm not. <laughs> I think both, uh, you know, Alex and Mihailo make good points. And there's there's, there's a trade-off here. I think one way, uh, and you know, two, two things I'll say is one, for, for users that are actually curious about learning about these trade-offs, uh, you know, I'm not affiliated at all, but the website L2B really does a fantastic job of user education here and, and tries to really expose these. Uh, the one high-level thing I'll say uh, is, and I think really Alex touched on this point as well, is there, there, there are different types of trade-offs. There are trade-offs that are uh, fundamental to the technology and there are trade-offs that are, um, that are um, you know, the way that it's built today. And, and uh, you know, obviously you never know with software that there are no bugs, but like, let's use that as, you know, as the imaginative case. Let's say we knew that this code has absolutely no bugs. That's the, that's when this 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 really surfaces as you know uh, can we get rid of all the all this uh, upgradability if there were no bugs um, and is this just for bugs or is it or is it inherent part of the way that the system works and you know in, in Arbitrum of course you know we have we we you know, we 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 struggle with these exact same questions and try to get to the best trade offs for users and so you know we do have like uh, like 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 everyone else does right now um, um, upgradability. And you know, right now we believe that fast upgradability is 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 important. Um, but but over time, we do not intend uh, to maintain that. And I'm not saying we'll ever get to a point where there are known that there are there are zero bugs. But I think you know you get closer on the on the asymptote there, and you get you get more comfort over time. So I think uh, really moving along the trajectory where you know the controls we maintain are not fundamental or not part of the protocol, but are but are just really for the ideally for the bootstrapping phase. And the full goal is to uh, get rid of them. Uh, the product that we're launching today, we call it a mainnet beta. And the reason why we're so insistent in calling it beta is because we want to keep ourselves honest and say, until we get rid of and until we're fully decentralized, it has to be beta because my, my my biggest fear, you know, I don't, I don't I don't care who it is. I don't care if it's us. I don't care if it's someone else. My biggest fear is that there's some solution that launch that launches and it keeps a lot of centralized power and it never goes away and the community accepts that so at least for we're doing our part by being very clear you know in the post that we'll put out today uh we're going to be very clear about these controls and what they are be clear that it's called a beta not because we don't think that they're the correct trade-off we think they're absolutely the correct trade-off but we also think that there's a path to get rid of them and that's important and users need to understand that's so when user transacts they have to they transact they should know exactly what they're doing and what they're getting into i think that's that's the best way to build is the uh, honesty and transparency. Steven, what's the policy of upgradability right now in in the beta? It's a it's a it's a you know, a multi sig with with uh, with the ability to to do fast upgrades. Like immediate. Yes. And how how many uh, signatures are required out of how many? Uh, well, we're going to post a lot of info about this later today. Got it. Perfect. Thanks. Yeah, I, I think that's definitely one of the, the the more important topics, and it fits right in with the the idea of like progressive decentralization. Hey, uh, you know, it's going to take time to get there, um, but yeah, definitely like the the safety per, first approach. Um, so I, I kind of want to go back a little bit when we're talking about the the withdrawal period, or more more like the challenge dispute period for for rollups. And uh, so more more of a question for Stephen and, and Alex. When are transactions actually? I'm assuming like confirmation times are relatively short, but when are transactions actually considered final? Is it uh, is there some way to finalize them within the rollup, or is, is are they not actually final until the the uh, dispute or challenge period ends? Uh, great question. Um, happy to take it. 
Uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll talk about for for us, and I'll let Alex talk about ZK rollup. Um, but at least for us, so, so it's two things happen. Um, the transaction gets posted on chain, and that happens very very quickly, where the data of your transaction gets posted. And at that point, everything else that happens is deterministic, which means the VM executes deterministically. As soon as your transaction is confirmed and locked in by the layer one, um, you'll know that if you're running a node or um, if you're using Etherscan or someone you you trust to be, to be giving you the correct results, like users doing Ethereum all the time, uh, then you have you'll have confidence that um, you'll have confidence that your transaction will happen by the security property of the rollup. Which means you know um, Ethereum won't allow you to do your withdrawal until it has confidence. But if someone tries to challenge falsely or someone tries to um, do something that's incorrect, you'll know that you unilaterally or anyone unilaterally, this is the one, anyone can be honest assumption, right? As long as there's anyone that's doing the right thing and they can get a transaction Ethereum in, 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 in a week's time, roughly, that they will um, get that. So in terms of, uh, you know, the way we view, view finality, uh, things that are going on the roll up, uh, you know, I think we, um, it's if you're running a node or if you're um, using uh, a service like Etherscan or some of you trust to run nodes, very similar to the way that people use uh, Ethereum, uh, they either run their own nodes or they rely on someone else uh, to do that, then you'll know that um, that that um, that transaction will be confirmed and is guaranteed to be confirmed. But uh, the withdrawal will be take a, take a week, right? Because I think Ethereum is the only one in the room that doesn't really know, and it has to wait a week for anyone to uh, to go ahead and and challenge it. Uh, but what you'll know is that hey, as long I know this is correct, my node tells me it's correct, or the node that I trust tells me it's correct. And if someone does challenge it, I know that's bogus, and I know that I'll be able to uh, respond and actually make a, a nice amount of money in the process by uh, defending it. Yes, yeah, so, so this is the difference between objective and subjective finality, and uh, they are different on uh, on optimistic rollups. Uh, on zk rollups, they are the same. The moment we post the proof on chain uh you have the finality and this normally happens as soon as we have the block full and the proof of this block generated right now in zk sync uh the blocks are being posted every few hours just because the uh it's the the amount of time we just justifies the block size as the current transaction volume uh with more transaction volume we expect the blocks to be filled with uh enough transactions to amortize the ver verification cost within maybe minutes, and then it will take a few minutes more to generate the proof, because the proofs in version two are being generated recursively. So it's, like, it, 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 it's a lot faster than uh, than the sequential generation, which is currently the case in version one. So overall, like you can get uh, finality in within, let's say, two minutes. So if you want to withdraw something from a ZK rollup, you don't have to wait hours. Even if there is not enough transaction volume, you, you always have an option to just pay slightly more, pay the full verification cost, like half a million gas uh, yourself, and uh, ask the, the validators to push, like to flash the transactions on, on layer one, and you can withdraw immediately. Awesome, thank you. Uh, that's great. Uh, I'm gonna go to one last question, but Mihaela, did you, did you want to jump in, any that, in in there and have any thoughts on that, or? No, I don't have anything to add. To okay. Me. Yeah. Uh, awesome. Yeah. So last one I, I really want to get into is uh, kind of want to talk about uh, the thoughts about, you know, all these other layer ones popping up, having their liquidity mining programs, almost like there, there, there's some like user leakage going off and it, and it gives this idea like if we're going off into a multi-chain world. And I, yeah, I definitely see that, um, that coming along, at least in the short term. And I kind of like to hear your perspectives on where do you think we're going as far as multi-chain? And is this, are, are we eventually seeing some consolidation? Is this a winner take most situation? Um, not only in the, in the respective chains, but also rollups um, as well. Do you think most are gonna gravitate towards one or are certain applications just gonna work out better on certain solutions than, than others? And Mihaela, I'll, I'll, I'll start with you. Yeah, sure, thanks. Um, yeah, it's indeed we're seeing uh, several uh, layer one, I guess, chains uh, announcing huge rounds or huge funds for liquidity mining incentives and whatnot. I, I am personally, I am, of course, first of all, uh, biased because I'm an active community member and I love Ethereum and all that. So, so I'm definitely biased, but I am yet to see, we have seen 
dozens, I think, at this point, uh, uh, layer one chains uh, coming along, uh, making big promises, even uh, creating a lot of hype and whatnot, raising gazillions and, and uh, never anything, never, nothing ever came out of it. So, so I'm yet to see a, a layer one that can actually, that I can consider s self-sustainable, I can consider uh, uh, an ecosystem with meaningful level of activity, with not to mention critical level of activity. So I think we're <coughs> all other layer twos are far, far away from Ethereum in terms of creating that critical mass and network effect. So I think we're nowhere close to it. But but it is, of course, great that, uh, that this ecosystem is open and everyone should you know work on tech and create whatever they want to create, whether it's layer one or layer two or something in between. Of course, innovation is always welcome and something good will come out of all these efforts for sure. And it's already coming out. But uh, I guess to answer your question, I, I'm still not seeing any any meaningful competitor to Ethereum in terms of layer one. I'm not seeing anywhere even remotely close to it. Like when you just look at the sheer amount of innovation, that permissionless innovation that's happening in Ethereum and teams popping around, like it's, there's only three of us on on this panel, but there are hundreds of us building different types of the stack, uh, whether it's on the uh, user experience level, dev tooling, all these things, like it's a huge, huge e organic ecosystem that it will be extremely hard to replicate. Like I think borderline impossible, but again, please take this with a grain of salt because I'm a huge fan of Ethereum, of course, and all that. Alex, same question. Uh, so I think this is this time is very interesting. Uh, it's it, this time is different because uh, in in uh, previous attempts to kill Ethereum, the uh, other chains had uh, used different technologies. But this time, everyone understood the mistake, and they are all converging around Solidity and EVM, which makes it very easy to bootstrap ecosystems, at least on the developer supply side. So you click, they are they are porting all the existing applications, like a lot of applications from Ethereum are becoming available at these uh, other chains. Uh, so it's it, now it's a question, can you also uh, port over users? Can you offer incentives to users? Not, not just like, if you do liquidity mining, what you attract is liquidity, as the name suggests, right? Because you offer incentives to bring liquidity to your chain. But to bring users to your chain, you you you, you need to, to uh, let them overcome, overcome the UX barriers. So they need to install different wallets, different extensions, not MetaMask, but something different for, for this particular chain uh, and start using it, get familiar with it. And uh, not so many people are motivated to do this. So they, they have two paths. Either they go and get new users entirely like from outside the ecosystem, like something like uh, what uh, Binance chain did partly. They just brought the users from Binance over to, to this chain. Who never knew like who were asking like who, who who is vitalik this guy who sold all our all our dog coins um <laughs> you know like they it, it's it, it was completely different time so they, they are a new class of users so like if those chain manage to attract new users they might have a chance uh but uh if those channels appear why would those users not come to ethereum which have, has this powerful mind share of existing users who are very, very passionate and very strong in promoting Ethereum, promoting Ethereum values, because Ethereum is, is a chain based on values. A lot of people forget that. Like it's, it originated with, you know, like a, in the spirit of the crypto punk movement of 1990s, it, through Bitcoin, through, through all the hardcore cryptography, uh, like building the, the, this, um, this alternative financial system for sovereign individuals, it's very ideologically driven. And there are a lot of people who are diehard supporters because of ideology. And Ethereum is the most decentralized chain from all. Like it's, it's, it's the most resilient, it's hardest to attack. You cannot attack Ethereum with subpoenas, but you can do it easily with a lot of other chains where you just go to the validators, you know them personally, and you give them a subpoena, which forces them to silently do some bad actions uh, on, on like the state behalf against the users. You can't do that with Ethereum or Bitcoin. And I think these are the two, the only two chains which have this property. This is very, very important. But still, the fact that you can easily migrate now because they, there are no technological barriers because Avi and uh, you know, like, oh, 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 like a lot of applications are, 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 are being run on those chains is interesting. Uh, it's harder to migrate liquidity 
because there are no trusted bridges and uh, uh, and the exchanges which were previously used to do this are now becoming more complicated to use. Like Binance just introduced KYC, which means new risks, right? You you, you bring your, your funds into Binance account and all of a sudden it's frozen because you didn't pass KYC and, and uh, they, the, the bank thinks you're suspicious. And this happens to me all the time. My, my credit card transactions fail <laughs> because apparently I look like a cyber criminal like all the time. Uh, and like, th this is just like risky and scary. So people are not like, it's hard to move things from, from, uh, from Ethereum uh, outside, right? And if you use bridges, again, we have security problems with bridges. We all remember what happened with the Bali network with a half a billion dollar hack uh, just a few weeks ago. It's scary, it, it, it's difficult. Now within Ethereum, it's an entirely different story. Like, moving funds between our different rollups is easy natural and straightforward it's 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 completely seamless because you just move them to ethereum mainnet and then you move them to a different rollup or you just pass a message from one rollup bridge over the mainnet to the other and you kind of deposit directly from one rollup to, to the other one or you use bridges like connects and and uh, other uh, bridging solutions so this is going to be very interesting to see it's going to be like very very easy to migrate uh between the the ecosystems and the network effects might not be so strong as what kept Ethereum uh, from from being killed by by the Ethereum killers with allegedly better technology. So I think here it's really gonna be uh, in the end the users will stick with 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 the tech which fulfills the the promises, which offers them what they want uh, to the highest degree. Like you're not gonna migrate from one chain to the other if you have a, just a marginal improvement. But you have a 10x improvement in costs, or you have an entirely new functionality, which is not possible on, on the on the on, on the one thing, and it's easy for you to migrate, then you might very well consider it. So it's gonna be a very different game with very different dynamics. Uh, and we'll see how, how that works. Like probably for some cases, uh, we will definitely see a multi-chain world, but my gut feeling it's gonna be closer to this uh uh winner take mo takes most dynamics simply because it's so easy to move because the barriers are so low it's it's much harder to keep users in one place but yeah we will we'll see no one knows for sure i love it steven take us home yeah it's, it's a great question and i think uh basically you know uh like everyone else here uh, both personally and, and as a company, you know, we're big build believers in the Ethereum ecosystem and, you know, for many reasons, one is it's philosophical and ideological. Uh, we believe in, in the, in the trade-offs that Ethereum makes, cause you know, every layer one makes trade-offs and, um, uh, Ethereum makes some pretty explicit ones, uh, in for decentralization and security, which, which we think are important and particularly, which, uh, you know, lead to, um, some problems that we, uh, believe that we can solve in a way that doesn't compromise on, on those on those core um, choices. Um, but yeah, I do also think, uh, you know, um, within Ethereum, I think the multi-chain world that we're going to see is the multi-chain world within Ethereum. Um, and, you know, uh, you know, even, even uh, like I said before, even if we can get, you know, uh, 50,000 TPS, we're, we're not going to want to do that in one roll up uh, or, or going to have to have some pretty technological advances until then. And we're going to, we're going to see, um, uh, you know, self uh, sharding i'll say for lack of a better word even among rollups where you'll have maybe you'll have the, the DeFi roll up and the nft roll up maybe next you'll have the gaming roll up or whatever comes in a year from now we definitely won't be able to predict it on this call uh whatever the next uh, the next uh you know uh hype uh hype thing is and i think that that that's important and, that, and that's good and i think that's the and that's why you know for me, when I look at Connext and Hop and Seller and these protocols, uh, it's not about, the, I think the short term is really, you know, moving in between, you know, multi-chain L1. I think the, the long-term importance of these protocols is going to be moving between uh, the many instances of, of rollups and, and and other, you know, adjacent scaling solutions you have in Ethereum. And I think, you know, this is non-controversial, right? So it doesn't matter if you, you know, which of these scaling solutions you believe in, you know, and we see an Arbitrum, it's what we already have. Uh, two instances of Arbitrum. We have Arbitrum 1, which is our main DeFi chain, and we have the Arbitrum Reddit chain. And that's natural, and that's important, and I think that's the place uh, we're going to have to go over time. So I'm a big believer in, in Ethereum, and I'm a believer in the multi-chain world, but the multi-chain world that I talk about lives on Ethereum. Bailey, are you, are you playing us off? 
Sorry? No, I just wanted to second what, what Steven said, of course, and that's the vision of Polygon. Polygon is, if you go to our website, it says Ethereum's Internet of Blockchain or Ethereum's Multi-Chain. That's exactly, I can only echo what, what Steven said, yeah, of course. And it's going to be very interesting, actually, to, to um, Alex's point. Um, first of all, uh, porting, uh, uh, chains are now, <laughs> Ethereum killers are getting smarter. So now they're focusing, they're using EVM. but. Ethereum compatibility is actually a, a process becoming, we, we know, we have been through that, like there's so many tools, so many things. It's not only about introducing EVM implementation on your chain. It's the thing only starts then, like we, we know how long and painful was that process to have full compatibility with all the toolings and everything. So, it's, so again, it's something that these chains will have to go through and I'm questioning whether they will be, you know, uh, stubborn enough to, to, to get all of that done. And the second thing is that, as Alex said rightly, like Ethereum and, and Steven, Ethereum is more about uh, values, about shared values. And um, I, I think it's fair to say that some of these chains have seen the success of Polygon, for example, this Polygon POS chain and what we did, did with these incentives. And, and they are now kind of replicating that, that approach. But I think it, it, I can't wait to see actually results because uh, if my theory is right, it's not only about these incentives. You have incentives also elsewhere, and if we had incentives before. I think people understand. For example, with Polygon, they people understand that they are still within the Ethereum ecosystem, and they understand. Okay, this POS chain is a, a, a solution that works today, but this team is working towards even better solutions, and uh, it's fully aligned with this. Uh, um, Ethereum mythos and commitment towards decentralization, high security, and etc. With these chains, these chains are from day zero, day one, they're accepting certain trade-offs normally in terms of decentralization, and there is no plan on becoming better. That's that's the major difference, I guess. Yeah, yeah. But Sorry if I took. <laughs> no, that's okay. That's okay. I I honestly hate to stop you guys because this was a really fascinating conversation. So thank you so much. Um, but if anyone wants to keep ca continuing this conversation, you can do that at Mainnet 2021, and that is coming up. Nice segue. Thank you for <laughs> thank you for that, guys. Um, that's coming up September 20th through 22nd in New York City. Although we will also have a virtual platform, you can grab your passes. I threw a $450 discount discount code into the chat and I will throw that in once we um, once we round up here. Um, there's also one more crowdcast before mainnet and that's going to be about DAOs. So I will also throw that link in and I promise we'll have the right timing this time. So in case anybody has been here for the last couple hours, thank you so much for being here and being so engaged and listening to this conversation. Um, so yeah, that's all for us. Again, thanks guys. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Thanks for joining us, guys. Congrats, congrats again, Stephen. Thank That's you so much. Awesome. Thanks a lot. Yeah.